We keep that field of experience very small. We don't try new things. When I was in Kansas every year in the fall, November, I would take a group of students to the National Association of College Broadcasters Conference at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. I'd take five or six students with me. And very often I would take students that had never been out of Kansas before, grew up on the farm in Kansas and had never left the state before. One year I took with me a student who had never left his home county before, had never left the county. The only time he had ever left his home county was when he went to the next county over to go to college, to go to school. That's the farthest he had ever been from home before. So now Don was going to fly in an airplane, going to go to Kansas City, get on an airplane, fly to Providence, Rhode Island, go to this conference, all kinds of new things. We get to Providence and we find out that our hotel is right across the bridge from Little Italy in downtown Providence. Just streets of Italian restaurants and bakeries and shops. It was wonderful. All the, the smells, the foods were fantastic. We found this little hole-in-the-wall restaurant, that Italian restaurant, that specialized in seafood, Italian dishes, just all kinds of uh, wonderful stuff to eat. We sat at a big round table, and the waitress was this little, little old Italian woman that came around and found out we were from Kansas and everything. So we go around, there's six or seven of us, and we go around and everyone orders something different, shrimp and lobster, pastas, and all these kinds of things because we all wanted to try different things, see different things. We get around the table to Don, the student who had never left his home county, and Don ordered the southern fried chicken. And she looked at him and said, are you sure you don't want to? No, I like southern fried chicken. So that's what he ordered. The whole time we were in Providence, Don ate fried chicken, uh, plain cheeseburgers, or pepperoni pizza. Those are the only three things he would eat. On Sunday, we had Sunday off from the conference, so I rented a car and took him up to Boston. We toured around Boston. Then we drove down the coast to Plymouth, Massachusetts, stopped in Plymouth so they could see Plymouth Rock and everything. When we got there, the lobster boats were coming in. And there was a little diner right out on the dock. You could get twin lobster dinners, two lobsters with baked potatoes, all the fixings, corn on the cob, and it was $6.99, $6.99. So we're snarfing. We're, Don orders a plain cheeseburger. Don, try the lobster. No, I don't like lobster. Have you ever had it? No, I've never had it, but I won't like it. I don't like lobster. Keeping that field, he had all these opportunities to increase that field of experience to try new things, but he was really good at keeping that field of experience a limited because this is what we like. This is what we're comfortable with. All those students get back to Kansas and they're telling these stories about, oh man, we had lobster and we had this and we had... Don had cheeseburgers to talk about. He didn't experience, even though we were across the country, he really didn't experience anything new. He kept that field of experience limited. The, the best illustration that I've experienced of keeping that field of experience limited, my mom was deputy county clerk at the courthouse in Kansas, and her boss, the county clerk, won a trip for two to London, England. All expenses paid. So she and her husband fly over to London, England, spend a week over there, five days, something like that. They come back, and everybody at the courthouse is all excited. How was your trip? What did you think of London? What did they hated it. Had a horrible time. Horrible time? Everything was paid for. How did you have a horrible time in London? They liked to line dance. That was what they did. That was their hobby. And they could not find a country western bar in all of London to line dance in. So they stayed in their hotel room, pouted, upset. That's keeping a limited field of experience. The effective communicator realizes that the field of experience is directly proportional to their ability to communicate effectively. The more things you try, yeah, you can say you don't like it. If you've tried it, then you can talk intelligently about it. Just trying it doesn't mean that you have to agree with it or that you have to like it. But now you've tried it, you've experienced something different. It's directly proportional to, you, to your ability to communicate effectively. The effective communicator, this is the quote you need to have in your notes, the effective communicator is willing to try new things to increase their field of experience. 
the effective communicator is willing to try new things to increase their field of experience. They don't want to limit that field of experience. So if on the test I ask you what causes indiscrimination, it's a limited field of experience. It's a lack of education. If you think Baptists don't dance, it's because the Baptists that you know don't dance. You haven't experienced anything different. Indiscrimination is caused by a limited field of experience from lack of education. The effective communicator is willing to try new things to increase that field of experience. Okay. Uh, last one. Number seven is called polarization. Polarization. Uh, polarization is sometimes refer, referred to as the fallacy of either or. The fallacy of either or. What's a fallacy? Illogical reasoning. Yeah, it's illogical reasoning. It's something that is not true. A fallacy, we tend to believe it's true, but it really isn't. It's something that we believe are true. Polarization is called the fallacy of either or. If something is polarized, you might have heard uh, in the news recently, Congress is polarized on this issue. It means that there's opposite ends. There's op polarized means that there's opposite ends. We say that uh, we have a, the, the planet has a North Pole and a South Pole. It's polarized. The fallacy of either or polarization talks about the extreme ends of the spectrum. And we use either or to describe that. You are either conservative or you're liberal. You're either rich or you're poor. You're either sick or you're healthy. You're either tall or you're short. We could go on and on with these examples. The Western languages, English especially, Western languages are described as polarized language, it's, it's easy for us, a lot easier for us, speaking English, speaking the Western languages, to describe the extremes. We have great words to describe the extremes. It's very difficult for us to describe that middle ground, that middle area. That's pretty typical of Western languages. They're very, very polarized. They are focused on the extremes. You're either this or you're that. That's polarization. Now I keep saying the Western languages, English. The Eastern languages, a lot easier. They're a lot more descriptive. They're a lot more colorful. They can describe the middle ground a lot easier than the Western languages can, than English can. That's why it's so hard to, um, what's the word I'm going to translate, why it's so hard to translate those languages into English. Greek, Hebrew, uh, any of the Asian languages, Japanese, Chinese, those languages are very, very difficult to translate into English because we don't have those middle words. We don't have those middle terms. Our language is polarized. It describes the ends. Now, there's a whole study, this is some weighty stuff, um, called the Orphean, if you're going to Google it, you probably find it under some peer Orphean hypothesis. This is important to know. This is good stuff. Someday someone's going to ask you about this or you'll be in a class somewhere and they'll bring up the Orphean hypothesis or the Sapir Orphean hypothesis and you'll blow them out of the water. We spent weeks studying this in grad school. You could go on and on forever about the Sapir Orphean hypothesis. Um, but what it says, broken down, simplified, the Orphean hypothesis says that the way that you talk, the way that you speak, influences the way you think. The superior Orphean hypothesis, or just Orphean hypothesis, states that the way you speak, the way your language is formed, impacts the way you think. 
the way you talk impacts the way you think. So in grad school, we talked about humor. How does the Orphean hypothesis relate to humor and our use of humor? And what we looked at and what we discussed was what we call blue humor. Uh, people that would tell racist jokes or dumb blonde jokes or whatever. That if you do that often enough, if that's the way you talk, if that's the way you go through life, that's the way you start to think. You start to see the world that way. So if we apply that to polarization, one of the problems that we have using a polarized language, putting these people in extreme categories, you are either conservative or you're liberal, we start to see the world that way. Most people don't fit in those extreme categories. They fit somewhere in the middle. We're not all Rush Limbaugh. We're somewhere in the middle. And yet, with our language, it's so hard to describe that middle ground. We can describe the ends of the spectrum, but we have a very difficult time describing that middle ground. And we start to see the world there in, in that way. We start to put people in those extreme categories because of our language. That's what the severe Orphean hypothesis would say. So, I love this in the book. They talk about polarization and how our language doesn't have middle terms, and it's so difficult for us to describe that middle area, the middle ground. So the correction that they have for polarization is to use middle terms. Use middle terms. Okay, you just spent two pages telling us that we don't have middle terms. Try to see people in that middle area. Very few people fit into those extreme categories. Most of us are somewhere in between. Try to see the world that way. Try to avoid those labels, those terms that, pe that place people in those extreme categories. Does that make sense? You might want to Google Orphean Hypothesis. It, I, like I said, it's pretty weighty. You can spend an awful lot of time studying that and looking at that. But the, the simplified, uh, simplified definition of it is the way you talk influences, impacts the way you think. Okay, let's take a break. Um, about 5 to 11, come back about 10 minutes, and we'll go over the study guide, work on the study guide a little bit, and we're done with chapter 5.